The Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 1, Now these are they that came to David to Ziklag while he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. And they were among the mighty men, helpers of the war. Now David is fleeing right now from Saul. And he's trying to escape Saul and he's hiding out. And the Bible says that these men came to him and they were coming from all different tribes. They were coming from all different areas. They were the disgruntled, the disaffected. Uh, they were the rough riders. They were a rough crowd. But they were coming to David because they knew that the future and the power of God was with him. Now it begins to list them, and you'll notice in verses all the way down, it begins to list a lot of the different men, verse number 8. And then again in verse number 23, it begins this list. And there are a lot of different men. But I want to focus in on verse number 32 this morning. The Bible says, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all of their brethren were at their commandment. I want you to notice that little phrase there. These men had something unusual about them. All of these men were men of war, no doubt about it. All of them could fight. All of them could ride. All of them were right there with King David. But these were unusual men because they understood, they had understanding of the times, and they knew what to do. Now that's the issue. It's not just understanding yeah. the times that we're in, but what are we to do? about the times. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, what are we to do? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray now that you would bless the word of God. If there's one that's lost, I pray that they would be saved. And those that are saved, I pray that they would be fed. I pray that as a whole, Sun Coast Baptist Church would be strengthened. And I pray that individually, our homes, our lives, our hearts would be strengthened and made closer to you. Bind the powers of darkness, I pray. And I ask that you would give each and every person in this room an unusual attentiveness to the Word of God. On this day, Father, I pray that Jesus Christ would be magnified, sinners would be saved, and souls would be fed. And when we leave God's house, we will have known that we have heard from you. Hide me behind the cross. Help me, dear Heavenly Father, to preach your Word as you would have me to. And we'll be sure to give you the glory, for it's in the precious name of Jesus we make our prayer this morning. Amen and amen. Look at that text again. They were men that understood or had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Friday morning, I got to the office early and uh, I uh, read a little bit of my Bible and then I started into my prayer journal and I started to write a few notes of things that I wanted to pray. And I couldn't help but be uh, somewhat overwhelmed by what I was seeing on the news and hearing in our nation and, and watching what was going on. Frustrated would be a word that would, would, would describe. Angry would be a word. Fearful. Uh, my children are, are just about ready to go out into the world. And so I was fearful for them and thinking, what kind of America are, are they going to face in the next 20 years of their life? And, and then uh, uh, my nephew had a uh, birthday was Wednesday, but it was celebrating the next day. And, and I was thinking about uh, uh, Brother Rich and Heather, their, their children. And I was thinking, my goodness alive, if my children are going to face this in 10 years, what are they going to be facing in 20 years? And, and it just, I just kind of felt overwhelmed a little bit. And I actually jotted down in my prayer journal, Lord, I, there's a lot wrong, but what do you do about it? What do I do? And I, and I think to some degree that, that could be a description of all of us. We, we get on Facebook and we're, we're talking and we're watching the news. But what do you do? Where do you go? How do you change anything. And what happens is usually there's a fight mentality. I, I'm about three-fourths ready to fight. And uh, then there's a fear mentality. And then I think one of the most awful of all is there is an escapist mentality. Well, I can't do anything, so I better just make as much money as I can and do my own thing. And if me and mine are okay, then well, you know, if they want to burn down their stuff, that's fine, but I'm just going to take care of myself. And, and all of those are wrong, fundamentally. For us to live in wisdom and for us to live in the reality of where we are and what's going on, it is vital that you and I understand the times, but it is even more vital that you and I know what to do about the times. We all feel like we want to do something, I think, but what? What will actually make a difference? Have you ever written uh, or composed, and I know some of you have, a brilliant piece of literary Facebook post? <laughs> 
knowing that those that read this post will be so revolutionized by your truth that it will spark a nationwide revival of back to God only to find that the morons that read it have no clue of what you were saying. Am I the only one? Can I get an amen? Yes, it's true. So, so what are we to do that's actually going to make a difference for my family, for my country, most importantly for my Lord and for my Savior? The men of Issachar understood the times and they understood what we're supposed to do. And this morning, I want to answer those two questions for you. Because to be able to answer the second one, what are we supposed to do, you have to first understand exactly what the times are. And I don't think we fundamentally do. I think we see a lot of things and we're making surface judgments and assessments, but I don't know that we really fully understand what's happening nationally and spiritually. But if we can get that picture, then how and what we're supposed to do begins to fall in line right from the Word of God. And so let me begin, first of all, by dealing with exactly what are we seeing going on nationally? What is, what is happening? And I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that what you're seeing happening this morning and around, around the nation, and, and fundamentally, I think, even around the world, is a revival of Marxist, anarchist communism that is packaged as postmodernism. Now, if that's too many isms for you, go home and look it up, and I'll work with you after the service. But what I want you to understand is that what you're seeing is an intentional revolution to destroy the last bastion, however weak it is. And there's no, uh, there's no uh, illusion about the flaws of the United States of America. But it still is the last bastion of any kind of country and any kind of civilization predicated on the Judeo-Christian ethic. Right. Yes, sir. That's right. it. That's right. And what you're seeing is an intentional Marxist communist revolution while we were asleep in the 90s getting bigger houses and bigger SUVs, while we were learning how to use our iPhone, there has been a groundswell of revolution that is being pumped out of our universities, pumped across our television screens, and pumped through the music. And you and I are seeing that reality percolate. And I want to say this, and I'll be very clear. Communism is not a political issue. Communism is a spiritual issue. There is no group of people anywhere on the face of this earth that has done any more damage, maybe than the Catholic Church as an organization, that has done any more damage to the body of Christ than communism. Their hands drip with the blood of Christianity from Romania to Central America, and that has not just come to our shores, it has been incubated, it has been, it has been uh, insulated, it has been trained and nurtured and brought up. The communism that you and I are seeing is an intentional design to destroy the last vestiges of the Christian ethic in the United States of America. Now, just like a lot of pastors, and thank God we got one here. Was, we were laughing the other day, boy, when Brother Tucker was preaching, he was preaching from a bullhorn. And, uh, boy, they stayed open and did what was right. But just like a lot of preachers didn't seem to see what was coming here a couple months ago, they don't seem to be seeing it now. And this thing is so much bigger than you and I understand. We are in a new era. The fact of the matter is, now let me get very particular with you, and this is not so much of a rah-rah message as you might think. I want to educate you. I want you to see so that you understand spiritually what's happening. What you are seeing in a nation on the TV is a nation that has unanchored itself from God, and it has been adrift, and it has a, it's a beautiful ship. It's a beautiful ship but it is a defenseless ship. And as it has unanchored itself from the foundation of God, it has drifted into the waters of piracy. And that is what is happening. We are being stormed by the pirates of communism. And these issues are tools to bring about this new order. And all of the issues that you are seeing are simply surface issues that are vehicles to bring in the real issue and that is chaos and destruction and the erosion of any hint of God whatsoever. 
That is what is at stake. It is not about taxes. It's not about all those things that you see. It is about destroying the last vestige of a system that still honors God. That is what it is. It is always spiritual. The Bible says in Psalms chapter number 9 that all nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. Grab your Bible real quick and look at that. I want to show you something that jumped out to me just a moment ago, a, a couple days ago. Psalms chapter number 9, very, very quickly. You say, well, preacher, you shouldn't be so political. I'm not. I'm being spiritual. Yes. Political is, is a whole different monster. Yes. Spirituality is where we are. And look at what it says in Psalms chapter number 9, verse number 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Now, some people every once in a while will come up and say, Preacher, where is America in the Bible? Well, you might be able to find a shadow of America in the book of Revelation, or you might be able to find a shadow of America uh, over there in the book of Daniel. But if you want to know where America is, it's right smack dab in the middle of Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. You know what stood out to me the other day, and this might be very simplistic to you, but you know what stood out to me? It says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That strongly implies to forget somebody, you had to know them in the first place. There was a time when this nation knew God. She knew the God that gave her the freedoms that she had. But we have forgotten God and we have put ourselves on a crash course collision and what has infiltrated our society from our schools to everything else is a Marxist revolution. And ladies and gentlemen, this is so much more fundamentally different than what you saw in the 60s. There was a few of them in the 60s that were stirring up a bunch of hippies and that kind of thing. This is nowhere near the same. Those were actually ideological. They actually had some ends that they wanted and some reforms. This is not about reform. This is not about a new day. This is about the destruction of a way of life because that way of life is based upon God and the two are enemies. Now let me, let me be clear with some of these issues and just enumerate them. And I don't want to get bogged down. Lord knows I could, but I don't want to get bogged down. But you have to understand that what you're seeing on TV, that's not the issue. They are vehicles to bring in the issue of chaos and destruction. And for instance, the issue of racism that we're dealing with today. The issue of racism is a tool. It is not designed at all to help the black culture. There is absolutely nothing whatsoever that this has to do with black lives. It has to do with a vehicle to usher in chaos and disruption. I saw the other day, I think it was yesterday, that uh, the mayor of Washington, D.C. had painted with tax dollars, mind you, on tax roads. He had painted Black Lives Matters. Well, I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We ought to be able to go in next week and paint on there, Jesus saves. Yeah. Amen. It's my tax money. It's as much my road as it is theirs. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with, listen to me, and young people especially, racism is not what they're saying that it is. If they really had a concern for black lives, they would have gone into Chicago after Memorial Day and dealt with the bloodshed that's there. Don't get mad at the, 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 the instances, and I'm not for police brutality. I'll get to that in a minute. Don't get mad at those instances when you got a little girl who's 10 years old, gets her brains blown out on a sidewalk, walking to a park. No, they don't care about that life. Why is that? Why is it that it's only now? Why is it that the way it is? Because it's not about race. But it's not even about Trump. It's not even about Republicans. It's not even about Democrats. If you don't get that, you'll miss the whole thing. It is about fundamentally undermining the foundation of this nation. And it's working. I've seen pictures of police officers taking a knee. I saw, I saw pictures the other day of National Guardmen kneeling down, taking a knee. If I was in charge, every single one of those men would be fired and dishonorably discharged you were not, uh, you did not take an oath to kneel. You took an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States of America. Listen, it'll be a cold day in, yeah, it'll be a cold day in hell before I kneel down to somebody. There's only two people I've ever knelt down to. One was God when I got saved, and the other was my wife when I asked her to marry me. Otherwise, it'll snow in hell before a grown man should kneel before another. There's a principle about that. Why is it? Because it has nothing to do. Nobody in America has experienced slavery. None. None. You say, well, the, 
the system is, is, is against them. Try go being a, a, a person of color in another country. Try it in Saudi Arabia. Go reform Saudi Arabia and then come back to America. Go reform North Korea, then come back to America. No, sir. But if you get if you get caught up into this black, white, black lives versus, and if you miss what's really going on, you're going to miss the reality. They don't care about it. It's nothing but a repackaged Marxism. Listen, all Marx did, Karl Marx and communism, all he did was pit the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. In other words, the rich against the poor, the, Right? That didn't work and it galactically failed. Now it's just the groups against those that have power. It's group identity politics. That's all it is. That's why you, listen, that's why when you go down, there's 50 different identifications. What are you? Man, woman, trans man, trans woman, homosexual, queer, lesbian. I mean, I don't even know what to list anymore. You say, have you remember it used to be the LGBT? Now it's Q, Z, F, X. I don't know what else you had in there. How many do we have of these? You got young guy, a transgender, a man who's now running in the state meets, and boy, he's breaking all kinds of records. And I can listen. Bruce Jenner got an award at ESPN for Athlete of the Year a couple years ago. You remember that? Yes or no? He should have gotten an award for Pervert of the Year. Man, why is it? It's group. It's trying to pit the groups against one another, men against women and women against men and blacks against whites and whites against blacks and Hispanics against Asians and Asians against this. And trans Why is that? So that the whole thing can catch on fire and crumble to the ground. As long as they can keep everybody fighting, there'll be a problem. And that's what they're looking for. The same thing can be true for COVID-19. It's very clear. It was crystal clear back then, but it's even more clear now that the reaction to COVID-19 had nothing to do with health. Right. If it did, they would be shutting down the protests the way they shut down the churches. We had preachers that were in fear. Some went to jail. Some churches just wondering if they could barely keep their doors open. And yet you open up the streets with no social distancing. And the mayors and the governors love to have it. So that tells me it had nothing to do with our health. It had nothing to do with our safety. It has to do with power and conditioning you and me to accept the government telling us when we can worship and when we can't. It is spiritual. Any preacher, any church that can't see that or hasn't seen that is spiritually inept. It has always been about that. Power to adjust. Why? Because it is a collision of ideologies. All of the Trumps in the world isn't going to change what's going on. The problem is the ideology that's per- perking up fr- from the. Listen, let me use it like this. Illustration like this. Brother Rich came up here the other day. He said, "Preacher, we got a problem." I said, "What's the problem?" He, no preacher likes to hear that. He said, "We got a sewage problem." And I said, "I know, but someone will get saved. We'll just keep praying for them." I, he, said, he said, "No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, real sewage." With all the rain and the flood and everything, while while the government was taking care of the rampant. COVID-19 that was going on between 11 a.m. and 5 a.m., 11 p.m. and 5 a.m., which is why the city councilmen felt like they needed to close everything down. Our our system can't handle it. And before we got back, we've got sewage over here. Now, listen, behind the church over here, it was was a lot. Bless, oh, poor Brother Dennis and and, uh, (laughs) Brother Tucker shows up and we're trying to show him how we do things. And we're back there shoveling sewage, trying to get the thing cleaned up. Welcome to how we do it at Suncoast, brother. Amen. <laughs> brother Paul, everybody's working back there. Now, there's a huge, that was a huge mess. It's a huge, they're, they're coming to work on it. Could you imagine if I ran in and said, listen, I'm going to clean that toilet bowl. Give me some Ajax and some Dawn. Give me a scrub brush. I'm going to make that toilet bowl just as clean and speak. In fact, I'm going to buy you a new one. I'm going to buy you a new one that's conservative. That will promise to lower your taxes. That'll do all I'm going to and put it in there. Listen, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm that's not the problem. Right, right. I, I may be putting a new face on the thing, so to say, but that isn't the problem. The problem is the mess out back. Yeah, yeah. Do you understand when you and I get caught up in all this stuff on the surface, you watch the news and you see all that. Do you understand that this stuff is percolating up from the sewage up? Come on, that's a problem. And it's true with Black Lives Matters. It's true with COVID-19. It's true with our education system. Listen, I remember years ago, I've, I've been at a part of it in two ways. I've taught in it. I've uh, administrated one. And I remember working out at Lakewood Ranch. I, I'm one of the saddest things in the world is what teachers have to put up with. 
Our education system has turned into a socialist, Marxist experiment to brainwash our children. And our children and that whole system has been allowed to be that way because of a self-consumed, uninterested generation of parents who ultimately care more about the sports program of the school than they do the character and the curriculum of the school. And if that curls your lip, the doors aren't locked. You come in here and boy, we need, we need money for our school, money for our school, we need money for our school. Well, go over to Southeast and shut their football program down. See how quick you have a ride on your hands. Go over here to Manatee and say, listen, we, we don't need sports. I mean, the kids can do sports on their own, but we want to put more money in the curriculum. Brother, they'd be in arms. You'd have a Manatee football militia before the sun came up. That's exactly right. And let me tell you something, just while I'm, just while I'm being honest. The, the biggest problem with the school system is not the money, it's not the testing, not the teachers, not the computers, not the government, not anything else. It's the parents yes, that drop them off and have a mindset that says, well, you take care of them and I'll pick them back up. I'm too busy making money. And you have. You've made a lot of money. You've got nice cars. You've got a nice home. You've got a vacation. You've got a little money in your 401k and you've got your plans for retirement. But heads up, the nation's going to hell. Yes. And it wasn't spawned over in Russia. It was spawned in your living room. Yeah, that's right, preacher. Education has been taken over and it's become more feely and touchy and psychological to the point where we got a math that's not even rational anymore. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you feel like two plus two is four? Do you feel like that today, Johnny? Won't you kick Johnny in the seat of the pants? Come on. Say amen. amen. In Christian love. Yeah. Nobody, when I was growing up, nobody asked how I felt. Two plus two is what? Four. Two plus three is what? Five. Do you feel like it? Listen, that's 1984 Orwellian stuff. I don't care what you feel like. And that's why, listen, you, I told you I was going to preach a while this morning, amen? That's why you got these moron kids running around out here in the streets. Actually, I heard a, 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 a reporter say, well, they're, they're acting out. And boy, when that happened, that drove me back to when I worked at Lakewood Ranch. I was sitting in a meeting one time where there was a young girl, I was in, I was hired to be in a, in a classroom, uh, a teacher's aide, but I was basically to be there to protect the teacher. We were working with the SE, uh, SED department, and some of these kids had, had records, and I remember the girl walked up, and she had a ruler, it was a steel ruler, and I was sitting there, and the teacher was sitting there, and she walked up and put it up to the neck of the teacher, and I reached over and, and grabbed it, I just saw it, and, and what was going on, and she, oh, I was just playing and everything, we had a meeting. Here's the thing. The girl had been diagnosed with some kind of psychological mumbo jumbo stuff. Nothing, all of that psychological medication would have been taken care of with about an inch and a half leather belt applied to her backside repeatedly. Right. They sat there and the psychologist in the meeting, because I was in the meeting, said, is this her diagnosis? Yes. Was she acting out on that diagnosis? Yes. That's an illness. We can't punish her for that. Now, that's the kind of stuff that our teachers have to swim in every day. Yeah, that's right. And then they finally call you one time and say, well, Jim, little Johnny ain't doing his work. And you get all huffy about it. Well, I just don't understand. Shame on this nation. Yes. Part of the reason this nation is going to hell is because of parents. That's right. But education has ushered in that elitism. You're a fool if you think Jeffrey Epstein killed himself. Yeah. <laughs> say, preacher, are you preaching? Yes, I certainly am. Yes, I certainly am. There are two levels. There are two levels of justice in this nation. There's a justice for those of us that don't have money and aren't stars. And then there's a justice for those that have money and politicians and, and the stardom. And you know as well as I do, if you and I did half of what Hillary Clinton would do, we'd have already been in jail. If we'd have done half of what some of these filthy, godless, good-for-nothing politicians do, we would be in jail. But there's two kinds. There's the kind where you and I get a $500 ticket for going two miles over the speed limit, and the kind where they keep on sinning and keep on sinning, and nobody cares. You know why our justice system's that way? Because we said, hey, take the Ten Commandments down out of Judge Roy Moore's uh, Supreme Court. We don't want justice. We want a relative experience of it. Do you understand the deeper roots of it? It's not just about the Ten Commandments. It's not just about the... There is something tectonic going on. And what has happened is we have unhinged ourselves from God and we're afloat on a sea of piracy. And all of the pirates have looked at us and seen they're weak. 
Now we'll wait. We'll just sit back and wait and let the scurvy set in. Let the lack of water set in. We'll just, they're under siege and we didn't even know it. We just thought that it was always going to last. And now here we are and we can't understand why we're being attacked from this way and that way and this way and that way. It's because we've unhinged ourselves. Let, let me keep going. One of the things that has destroyed our nation, and I know this will get me written up, but it is immigration and the farcical lie of diversity. Yes. Yes. In 1964, our United States government essentially closed the door in 1964 to European immigration, Western civilization, and open up the floodgates to the third world countries. And you see it on your TV every night and every day. The paganism has pummeled into this country. The dance, the dress, the music, the violence. There's not any rational person that hasn't been indoctrinated that doesn't look at what goes on the street and not say, you know what, that's tribal. That's violent. Nobody wants to say it because they're scared. But you're looking at somebody that doesn't dent my fender what you think of me one single bit. The fact of the matter is, it's tribal. It's violent. You know why? Listen. This past week, a man, old man, I remember when I was growing up, Brother Rich and I have talked about this before, if you went to the ball, went to the YMCA and the older guys were there, you had to mind your P's and Q's. You were a young fella. Listen, this past week, there was an old black man, retired, I believe he was a retired police officer, shot, yep. laying in the street, and people walking by taking videos of him. The same kind of thing that you've seen in Mogadishu. Yes. The same kind of thing that you've seen in Sierra Leone. The same kind of thing as you see in these other places. Right here in mainstream United States of America. Yes, We've opened up the floodgates. You know what's happened? We have brought in all of these things and they have paganized us. You ever watch? Well, you, you shouldn't. Have you ever seen the Super Bowl? Super Bowl at uh, halftime? Now, you have to worry about me from now on. I'll never watch another football game the rest of my life. I'd just soon watch two toddlers get out in the backyard and try to play football. I'll never watch the NFL again. You don't have to worry about that. But have you ever seen their halftime shows? Beloved, it's pagan. It's half-naked, tribal, pagan, strip, dancing, entertainment. And they're feeding the culture of that. And that's what we're dealing with. Why? You get all upset, but you've missed it. While we've been asleep, this nation, while we've been in here cleaning the toilet, the sewer's been filling up in the backyard. You understand what's happened? While we've been filling this, cleaning this toilet and deciding should we need this kind or that kind? Do we need a cushion seat or not cushion seat? Do we want this or that? The entire backyard, the entire house, we're surrounded with sewage now. And you walk out there and you don't even know where to begin. Yes or no? And that's why when you look out the window or you're on your front porch, you feel so overwhelmed. It's because you, you don't realize this is not about just maybe a little issue here or there. You've got two worlds at play, two spiritual worlds. I, another one is technology. Our children, beloved, listen to me. I, I thank God, and some of it had to do with our poverty. But I thank God that we were able to fight as long as we did to keep our children off of social media, off of cell phones. So, well, they need a cell phone. If they need one, listen, my daughter has a cell phone. And when she drives back and forth, I like to know where she is and where she's going. She's almost 20, but she's still mine. Yes, Amen. Yes, right. Until I marry her off to somebody in her oh. early 40s, she's still mine. Yes, Amen. Yes. yes, sir. You got one. I want to know it. But listen, there's a big difference in using that thing and then sitting there and you can't even talk to the average child yes. because they got that thing. They're looking at it. We let them have unmitigated access through PlayStation and Facebook and YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok. And the very inventors of it have already confessed and said, we designed it to be as addictive as it can be. They don't even let their children play on it. Read the articles that come out of Silicon Valley. They don't even let their own children do it. Why? Because they know it's more addictive than a drug. Why is that? It's designed to train our children. Listen, they've got apps now, supposedly, I don't know if it's true or not, that will help you be able to, the, the phone will be able to see in front of you. That way you won't run into anything while you're looking at the phone and walking. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Hey. You've got, only in America could you be that stupid. Yeah. 
Yeah. Say amen on that. Yeah. And we're laughing and playing. But what do you think your children are saying? Yeah. Who do you think your children are talking to? Children have the attention span, less of an attention span in the United States of America today than a goldfish. Scientifically proven, less attention span than a goldfish. Now, beloved, these are all vehicles. What I want you to understand is these things that I've mentioned, that's why it doesn't matter. At the beginning of the year, it was COVID-19. Do you remember what it was before that? You can't hardly remember. That's why it's hashtag Me Too movement, this movement, that movement. Don't, you feel overwhelmed, don't you? It's always a movement. Do you feel like that? You, you feel like you're always moving. Why is it? Because it doesn't matter to them. It doesn't matter to the left, to the Marxists, to the communists. Let me tell you something. You cannot be a leftist and be right with God. You cannot be a Democrat and be right with God. Come on. You can be saved and go to heaven. But you can't be for abortion and be right with God. You can't be anti-Israel and right with God. It's high time some preachers start saying these things. You say, I'm not a fan of Trump. I'm not either. But I'm not going to vote for a man who doesn't have a problem butchering a baby in the womb. Something's wrong. But that's why we're overwhelmed. You're tired. You're frustrated. You get almost, that's why you check out. Because there's always something. If it's not this, it's that. You know why? That's what they're doing. It doesn't matter what they chamber in their guns as long as they can fire around at you. Right now, it's Black Lives Movement. And you watch it. It'll run all the way down as far as it can into the winter. Then it gets a little too cold to protest. And the election will be over. Yes, and won't bat an eye. They'll change gears. They don't, give, they don't care one whit about the black man. It's just a vehicle to bring in Marxism and destroy the system. And when it's that, if it's not that, it'll be Russia collusion. If it's not Russia collusion, it'll be this. If it's not that, it'll be this. Why? To overwhelm the system, just to keep on. It's not one great big shark. It's just a thousand little piranhas bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. They know that this big old ship can't just be taken one at a time. But they also know we've unhinged ourselves from God. So just keep pecking, keep picking, keep getting at them, keep getting them. And eventually the scurvy and the rot and the ruin, they'll run out of cannon shells. And when they're weak and, and absolutely empty and, and defenseless, that's when it'll collapse. Yeah. You understand that's what's happening? Now we're trying to understand what's going on. And nationally, you have to see that. It, that's why you can get all, that's why you say, listen. Did you know that before I got mad at Black Lives Matters, I was mad at the, mil at the government? I'm, I'm mad at the militaristic government. These yep. governors, yep. these mayors, yep. that nitwit, slick back idiot hair out there in California yeah. who yeah. says, well, we'll have church doing that kind of thing. Like, who do you think you are, sir? Yeah. Drag him out and throw him in jail. Yeah. He's a traitor to the Constitution. Yeah. I'm mad at the government. I don't like, I, listen, I thank God for our police. We've got military men and police, but I don't like them with their pants bloused. I don't like them walking around. They're here to protect and serve. And if you're part, leave, leave the people alone. Brother Andrew, uh, uh, Brother Tucker was, I were talking. He was in uh, uh, Af, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan in combat. He and I were talking and he was telling me some stories. It was a fascinating story, fascinating. And I said something I, and I kind of bounced it off him. He said, I think you're right. I said, listen, I think too many of these guys are coming out of the military and going right into the police. I think there ought to be a waiting period of like five years or something. You're there to protect and serve. Yeah. You're not there to tell people what to do. And bless your sweetheart, when a man's handcuffed and he's about passed out, you don't have to, I don't care what the procedures say, get off his neck. Yeah. And all those other police officers should have standing around there should have yeah. slapped that fella halfway across the street and arrested him. Yeah. Yeah. But do you see what happens? It's just a vehicle. Mad at the military. Black Lives Matter. Hashtag this. This, that. Why? All just vehicles. It doesn't matter what it is. Why? They just want to undercut, cause confusion. Our children are checking out. You and I are checking out. We don't know what to do. It's a sea of sewage. Yes. And they're happy with it being that way. It doesn't matter what toilet you put in. They've got the yard filled with sewage. Now, that's nationally. Everybody still with me? Yes or no? Yes. Come on. Now, spiritually, where are we? Now, I won't be as long on this point. But spiritually, what is happening in our country? Well, what we're seeing is an abject reality of apostasy. Yes. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Yes, 2 Timothy and chapter number 3. You are seeing the reality of what preachers, a few of us, have been warning for years, and it's come. We've been standing out in the back, 
And while I've been changing toilets, going, you know what? We've got to have a toilet that's more relevant to this generation. We've got to have a welcome center for our toilet. You know what? We, we, we need more lighting and better seating for our toilet. You know what? Instead of standing at the toilet, I'm going to get a little computer and a latte so that I can chat with people. While that's been happening, the Brother Riches have been out going, Hey, we got a problem out back here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes or no? Yes. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter number 3, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Men, we see that today. Yes. You walk past a man bleeding and dying on the street. Yes. Little 14-year-old punk kid. A man had been knocked out. A little 14-year-old protester ran up and as hard as he could kicked the kid in the head. And when I was growing up, you fight, that kind of thing like that. But when a man was dead, he just kind of left it alone. Yep. He had enough. There's not a natural affection in our young people today. Listen, you've told them generation after generation, they're nothing but a glorified ape. Yep, that's, right. that's all they are. Yep. What do you think that they're going to do when they act that way? Natural affection. Notice what it says. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, false accusers, that's your media. Liars, bunch of pack of dirty hyena this world's ever seen is our media. Incontinent, fierce. There's a fierceness. You, it isn't just Antifa, beloved. Yes. You go back and match those old hippies up and watch them march. Listen, there was some bad stuff that went on at, uh, there was some bad stuff that went on at Woodstock and some of those kind of things. But there was a turn. You get that bigger crowd today, together today, and there's going to be rape and bloodshed. Yeah. And you know why? Because the generation's fierce. Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Here's the problem. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Yeah. I'll guarantee you 50% of those kids running around out there have been in a youth group. Yeah. I'll guarantee you that. Somebody probably prayed a prayer over them, did that kind of thing like that. We're seeing it. Now, I'm just going to mention a few of these, but we're seeing apostasy set in. And the number one issue is the rejection of a final authority in God's word. Amen. When that went out, there was, nobody knew where to go. What's your Bible say? You ever been in a church service before and the preacher reading? You're like, huh? Mine doesn't say that. Listen, you go preach somewhere and that one says something 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 and that says something. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't, you, you can't just make it up as you go along. I mean, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. When we kick this out, everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. The other thing I think is the abandonment of preachers. Yep. Psychology and teachers dominate the landscape. I'm going to say this very quickly and move on. It is better to say something wrong trying to say something to save a soul and a nation than to never say anything wrong, but ultimately to never say anything worthy of being heard. Yes, that's right. Do you hear that? There's many a time I'll go back on a Sunday morning and I'll think, God, oh, man, I don't think I should have said that. A couple of weeks ago, I got in the car and it's kind of quiet. And I said, honey, I, I was preaching about the kids that were doing the circles, the, 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 the donuts in the yard and tearing up the grass. She said, yes. And I said, I told them that we at the church that we need to be a little tender because we've all done stupid things when we were young. She said, yes. I said, honey, I think I told them that I, I'm going to give those kids a break because I've, I've done worse to grass. And she said, yes. And I said, honey, I think I said that I've done worse with grass. Just real quiet. Real quiet in the car. She said, yeah, that was the least offensive thing you said that day. <laughs> oh, there's many a time when I've gone back and I thought, man, I wish I'd have said that different or that different. But bless your sweetheart across this land today, there are men that stand up. They say nothing. Aggravate nobody. Yeah. Disturb no one. The world can leave them or take them. It doesn't, doesn't even bother. Why? Because they have lost the understanding that they are to stand between the living and the dead. Yes. And their job is to stand. I think false conversions are a big issue in our church. There are many people in our churches that don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Pray to prayer. Been baptized. I'll tell you one more. Or a few more. Empire builders. Everybody still with me this morning? They've been busy building great crowds and great followings, and we thought that they had the answer for old-time Christianity. Yes, 
But just as soon as the government told them to do what to do, like a hit dog, yep. they went barking and ran back up underneath the house. Right. Who are you talking about? I'm talking about fellas that will put out a video about Donald Trump's Bible. Yes, sir. Come on. And if you're not sure who that is, his name's Clarence Larkin, uh, 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 Clarence Sexton. He'll put out a video about uh, Donald Trump's Bible and revival, but he won't take a stand to keep his doors open or say yeah. no to the governor yeah. and do what's right to do. Yeah. I, could, I could give a rip less what Bible Donald Trump uses. Yes, what about your church? What about where we are? Uh, uh, what about, I'm talking about people that will guilt you into giving for a Lottie Moon offering yep. and then have the audacity to raise millions of dollars for a welcome center. You mean we, we mean we got to reach people with the gospel? Yes, sir, please. For our Lottie Moon offering now, we need you to give. We need Southern Baptist. Oh, we need you to give. The world needs it. And then now we also need a, a, a $4 million welcome center. Do you need that? You can't just put up a little table in a tent and say, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Talk to me now, yes or no. Good. I'm talking about people that will, that'll, that, listen, it, it, it become absolutely vapid. I think Christianity as a whole has become cowardly. Yes, sir. We've lost our manliness. I really mean that. Now, you might not like Suncoast, and that's okay. But you don't walk in here without knowing this is an alpha church. Yes. If you miss, and listen, I mean alpha male and women. Good. And I'm not talking about chest thumping. Not everybody's the same. I'm not talking about that. Listen, I, I'm, I happen to be a Renaissance man. I just as much enjoy being in a symphony as I enjoy going shooting. It doesn't, you don't, you, you, your taste is yours. But I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. There's a cowardliness about the Christian today. Yes, right. How many of you, just by a good hearty amen, how many of you just saw the news out there in Idaho at that town? I can't remember where it was. Quarter Lane. Quarter Lane but they heard... Antifa was going to come in here and they said, not in our house, you're not. And they had about 200 of those boys show up and women with their ARs and pistols downtown. Amen? Amen. Amen. Cowardly. What do you mean, preacher? I'll bet you 50% of those fellows were Christian yes. or called themselves Christian. And I'd like to take a survey and find out how many of them last year went downtown and handed out a gospel track. Right. Yes. So you're going to suit up? A weekend warrior, some Johnny come lately and get your toys out and go down there and defend your city, but you won't go down there and tell somebody how to get out of hell. On, you won't give somebody a gospel track. I don't, you, you, you listen, go, go back and play, yes, sir. or don't call yourself a Christian. Yes, sir. Right. Don't tell me that you believe that there's a hell where men and women can die yes, sir, in this right. life without Jesus Christ and yes, spend an eternity in the lake of fire. And you're going to run down and just and, and try to defend. And I'm all for it, man. Yeah. All for it. But the reason I don't mind preaching and doing what I'm doing right now, listen, my wife was joking the other day telling the preacher it's true, that hurricane that came through a couple years ago, one of the disappointments of my life is we had no looting in our neighborhood. <laughs> and she snapped a picture of me. I was sitting in my garage. I had my old style uh, uh, you know, canteen cup there with hot coffee. A cowboy style, just the grounds in the bottom. And I was sitting there, I had my AR on my lap, sitting in my garage, waiting, and no looters came. I think every man should have been doing that. Amen. You know why I don't mind doing that? Because I've knocked on every door in my neighborhood and given them an invitation to church. Some of them I've given pies to. I don't just care about my garage and my stuff. I care about their soul. And don't you saddle up and ride downtown and say, hey, we're going to stand for the foundations of this country. The foundation of this country, God bless you, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've got Christian men that will just assume, fight you and look at you, but are too scared to invite their waitress to come to church. Yeah. Or to knock on a door tonight, or to run up to a door and put something on there. No, I, I just can't do that. That's not my cup of tea. Yeah. Shame on Come you. On. Shame on you. So we've got a spiritual mess. We've got a national mess. We've been in here messing around with the toilet, and the, 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 the yard is flooded. So what do we do? Now that's the question. Everything I've said in here is like, yeah, 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 yeah. But if I just stopped right there, what do you do? Hey, I think you're right, preacher. Go to popies. <laughs> what do we do? Will you grab a pen and paper or your Bible real quick and write what I'm about to give you down? And I'm hurrying. I think we're making great time. 
But what I'm saying right now, very important now. What do we do? What do we do? Hear my soul. It is coming to our door. For years we've been able to say, yeah, boy, I hope we sort things out in downtown Tampa. I hope things work out over in Seminole. Hope it's coming. Beloved, Black Lives Matters. The massive amounts of violence are coming from white middle class kids that have been brainwashed at the schools that your taxes are paying for. It's coming. Okay? When you've got a mayor on a public street doing that, when you've got mayors that are, and, and listen, you've got uh, officers that are kneeling down, military that are kneeling down, it's coming. So what I'm saying right now is not raw, raw red meat. If you just want to be an escapist and just I'm just going to do my own thing and you just check out for the next five minutes. But what I'm telling you is vitally important for us as Christians. Number one, accept the situation. Actually believe what we have claimed. Accept where we are. That it is what it is and it's not going back. How many of you have heard over the last couple of months, I can't wait till we can get back to normal. Yeah. Not happening. That, that ship has sailed. And the changes that you're going to see moving forward in the United States of America are going to make the changes after 9-11 look like kids play. It's not going back. Now listen to me. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter and chapter number 4. 1 Peter and chapter number 4. For years and years and years and years and years, we have been saying, well, the end times are coming. Well, beloved, they're here. What did you think they were going to look like? Everybody's been walking around, I can't believe this is happening. Why? We've been saying it's going to happen. I can't believe people are that blind. Why? We've been saying it's going to happen. I, I just I just can't believe everything is falling apart. Well, you believed it when I drew it up on the board. You know why? Because you didn't really believe it. Yes. And you don't want it. You just want to be left alone. I just want to do my... Th Beloved, 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Why do you think that this is strange? What, pray tell, did you think that the end times are going to look like? You think we're going to be walking down the mall drinking lattes? Yeah, boy, things are really rough out over there. Boy, China's got it really bad. Yeah, you want to go to Gap? No, I'm good, but let's check the old Navy sail out. What's that sound we hear? The trumpet, the rapture. Yay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Amen. Talk to me. Amen. Yes or no? Amen. What did you think it was going to look like? You think it was going to be, listen, I remember years ago, I remember years ago when I was, um, uh, the first time I ever really uh, was boxing. And, and I remember my dad, we were at a camp. I mean, I mean, we grew up boxing and that kind of thing, but I'm just a little fella, I got in the ring and I remember the first couple of times I got hit. It's like, man, this guy's yeah. hitting me back. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I've done the bag before. I've your speed bag pretty good, but man, there's nothing like a sound when you hit that heavy bag. Pow! I like that sound. You know the problem with the heavy bag? It doesn't hit back. <laughs> I was thinking about um, um, Sam and I were talking the other day, and, and, and we, we, were, we were talking about different uh, taekwondo and jujitsu, and you go through something, you know, you have a teacher, and we had a really good teacher, so you go through the technique, and you're there. Okay, now I want you to do this, okay? And so when I get into full guard, you're going to do this, okay? And then you're going to scissor sweep it. And it so makes such sense going step by step slow. Right. <laughs> when they're cooperating with you. Yeah. Yeah. When someone's on you and has you in a choke and says, okay, now scissor sweep. You're like, okay, cool, no problem. Unless they don't want you to do that move. <laughs> yes or no? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I could win every fight if they'd stand there and choreograph the thing with me, you know, get matrix on them and all that. But beloved, what did you think the end times were going to look like? 
Do you know the most shocked people in all the world right now are people sitting in churches yes. who should not yeah. have oh, been Jesus. surprised? Right. Yes, sir. You know what it tells us? It tells us that we have taken this and set it to the side and taken the world and we've fallen in love with it. Yes, sir. I love my car. I love my job. I love my vacation. I love this stuff. Not really. I mean, I won't love it on Sunday. I'm going to amen you on Sunday. Give it, preacher. Get on that second coming. Yes, sir. Amen. And then Monday morning wakes up. Okay. <laughs> I miss you. Yes or no? Go home and you need to go back and slowly look at your Bible and read your Bible and you need to get your family together and you need to, in your whole heart, say, we need to accept this. this listen, beloved. It, it, listen, times are changing. <laughs> And you're not wrong for feeling angry about it. I had a sister tell me the other day, say, Preacher, I got so mad in the store. I don't want to walk the way that they're telling me to walk. Yep. Is that sin? <laughs> I said, Absolutely, it's not. The Bible says, Be angry and sin not. Yep. There is a time and a place. Now, if you were just waiting in line and they were going a little slow, you know, and you're trying to get wrung out and that girl's, you know, somebody's got coupons and you lose your temper, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. But there's a deeper meaning to why you don't want to follow those lines. You know why? Because communism is inbred in you. Amen. And that's what it is. It's a control grid. I mean, that's, that's a bunch of uh, nonsense. Come on. If you walk this way, there's no way the corona can come around and get you. <laughs> Stay six feet apart, not six and a half. It dies somewhere between the wormhole of six to six and a half feet. Five feet, you're a dead man. Listen, I went to public school and my wife wouldn't even go to the store with me every day. If it says go that way, I'm going that own way. Are you being rebellious? Yes. Yeah, I am in a biblical way. I don't have to follow lies. And listen, I'm not trying to be ugly and be silly, but that stuff is a lie. I don't like walking around hearing the Antichrist speak through the uh, uh, loudspeaker. Uh, make sure to practice. Man, I don't want to hear that. I just want to go in and get my Doritos and go home. Yes, Say amen. There's something in you that doesn't like that. Do you know what that is? It's a, you're, this is freedom. Yeah. This is a lie. This isn't true. It doesn't make sense. You don't have to lock up the tennis courts. There's not roving bands of COVID at the tennis court. You don't have to lock the boat ramp. God forbid you go. Why? Because there's insurgency COVID strikers on the water yeah. waiting for you yeah. you're an idiot man our government is rife with the most galactic size stupidity you can imagine so you better though get used to walking that way you better get used to checkpoints you better start expecting it and not getting i don't like it if I can defy it in a way and not go to jail, I will. But don't walk around sitting around in a wall of cooler going, I don't have a, I don't have a, yeah, well, hey, listen, Romanian Christians have been dealing with this for a long time. Right. Czechoslovakian, Yugoslavian, Russian, they're just saying, welcome to the party. What did you think that the end was going to look like? Yeah. Number two, very quickly, attend to your own affairs. Attend to your own affairs. The Bible said over there in 2 Timothy, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, you better attend to your own affairs. What do you mean by that, preacher? Here's what I mean. Jesus said, why are you trying to cast the, be the moat out of your brother's eye? You had a beam in yours. Preacher, I'm, I'm mad that this nation has turned against God and headed to hell. Yeah. It's good. You should be. Are you that equally mad about you? I'm angry at liberals and their, their wickedness. Well, what about your sin? Yes. Yes. I mean, the sins you committed last night. Yeah. Just as equally angry? Not as much. So easy to sit in here and let me give you red meat. Come on. So easy for you to sit there. Oh, bless God, you go the opposite way. Preach, I'm with you 100%. I'll go with you to public. And do it. We're just going to take our stand. Why don't you take a stand about the sin in your life? Yes. Yes. Well, that's different though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Preacher, I, I'm just so angry about the government robbing us of taxes. I'm, I am too. But I wonder what you're robbing from God. Yeah. Money? 
talent time? Preacher, there's so much sexual immorality in life. Bless God, those perverted transgender. Boy, somebody walk into the bathroom with my wife or daughter. I'll put in the, I'm with you 100%. If I was in there and some transgender walked in behind my wife, or if I was outside and some transgender started to walk in behind my wife or daughter, I would introduce them as quickly as I possibly could to the working end of my fist. Yes. Don't go in there. That's a woman's, that's a woman's restroom. And it's in rocket science. Amen. Amen. We got some medical people in our church, but I don't have to have a medical to know what's what. Okay. Yes, sir. I think you should be mad about that. Um, gentlemen, what are you looking at on the phone? So the sexual perversion in our world, that's wrong, but what you're looking at on the phone, that's okay. Let's got them tired of the way our women are being treated, how you treat your wife. Listen, every time I every time I preach on why, every time I preach on men, I can see the men start getting fidgety and and and. and, and. I, I, well, I just don't like the way our society is being turned upside down. I don't like those feminists. Well, why are you a feminist in your house? Well, the amens are dying out now, man. <laughs> you know why? Because you still don't understand what has brought us where we are. The hardest thing in the world to do is to say, well, the reason we are where we are is because of the man in the mirror. Yes. Amen. I'm mad because there are not men. Where's our men in this world? I don't know. Where are they in your home? Yes. You teach your son how to use a gun? You should. Teach your son how to defend? Amen. Listen, I, I was talking with Brother Jeremy the other day. I said, man, I think we're going to start self-defense classes here. Yes. I, amen. I'm for that. <laughs> I'm for that. He almost threw me for a loop. He said, well, I think First Baptist did that. That's a good idea. I said, no, that's not, now I can't do it. <laughs> Teach your son, amen. Men, when's the last time you prayed with your, with your son, with your children? You got them together. Well, I'm just not good at that kind of thing. Come on, man. Come on. Come yes. on. Yes. Don't tell me you're not good at that stuff. Don't tell me that. That's a cop out, man. Yes. Your son and your daughter, they don't need you to be good. They need you to be trying. That's right. And I'd rather hear a fella get down that's stunned. Listen, where is he? Where is Brother Chuck? Is he in here working? Where? Brother Chuck, our, one of our charter deacons. Brother Chuck, it, it, when I ask him to pray, you better have time. <laughs> He'll start, and he's got so much he wants to pray for. He'll start down the road, back up and go down here, and back up and go down there. And somewhere we end up around the missionaries in Ecuador, make our way back up around the food. Well, I've heard some people pray, and man, when they pray, you feel like... But listen, I'd rather hear Brother Chuck pray any day of the week. Amen. You know why? Because it comes from a heart. Yes, sir, that's right. Fathers, you're, you're, and, and grandfathers, well, listen, wh why don't you spend time this, it's, it's very, very easy. I propose, and I'm serious about this now, and I'm just about through, but I propose a, a one-month exodus from Facebook and news and everything else and getting back to spending time with our family. Yes. I mean, just playing some games and laughing and praying and, and, yes. and spending time together. Yes. I think also, write this down if you will, please. There should be an appeal for God's grace. Oh, that's right. Almost everybody in this room, I love you with all my heart, but I'd be willing to bet hard cash if I were a betting man. Almost everybody in this room has spent more time on Facebook this than they, this week than they have with God. I know that's a kind of a, a a hard comparison, but it at least gives us an idea. Check your time. How much you've been on your phone this week? Just check it. Check your time, and then tell me how much time you spent before the Lord in prayer. Why is that? You don't think it's going to come to Palmetto? But they'll never come and take our guns. They took your jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They took your parks. Yeah. They took some people's loved ones from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll let this bunch of animals march down the street and tear everything up and won't let a loved one see their sick loved one in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. What makes you think they won't come and take it? Yeah. You better pray. I mean, you better pray. You better pray. You better pray. You better get together with your family, get your life in order, and start praying. God, help us. God, give us strength. And then lastly, let me say this. You need to have action that is meaningful. 
Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians, and I'm through. 1 Corinthians, in just a few minutes. I know it's long. Please, will you give me five minutes? All in favor, say amen. amen. If you need to stretch, go for it. I'm with you. I'm stretching myself, but give me five minutes. It's worth it. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We need to appeal for God's grace. We need to be in prayer. Husbands, wives need to be praying. You need to pray with your family. Listen, we ought to have some people come up here to church from time to time early on a Sunday morning and pray. Yes. Say, preacher, I know we don't have Sunday school because of that COVID stuff right now, so I can sleep in, no harm, no foul, but every once in a while, you ought to get up here a little bit, a little bit early. Let me just get up here and pray a little bit. Walk around the property and pray a little bit. Pray, beloved. If we don't have mercy from God, she's done. Yes. Trump and all his tweets and 5,000 presidents like him is not going to save us because remember now, the vehicle doesn't matter. We have unhinged ourselves from God. Yeah. Got to pray. Got to pray. But then we got to have meaningful action. I won't make you read everything, but notice in verse number 13, chapter 3, verse 13. If you're there, give me an amen. Yeah, amen. All right, look at verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, there's two types. Gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. You got to have the right kind of action. I was uh, I was watching a YouTube video the other day about maybe a couple of weeks ago, and there were some guys, and they were in a, a little bit of a firefight. There was some a long distance sniper, and uh, these were actually British forces. Uh, they were Irish actually, and they were over in uh, I think it was Afghanistan. I think it was. And anyway, a fella got mad, <laughs> and they were trying to get you know it was just kind of a fella got mad and just stood up and just lit. I mean, full auto. And the fellow beside him said, feel better? <laughs> he goes, I do, mate. I do. He said, I do, mate. I feel a little better. I accomplished nothing, but I feel better. He couldn't have hit that sniper if he tried for the million dollars, but he felt a little better. He said, I do, mate. I feel a bit better. <laughs> I think that's the way we are. Let's go on Facebook. Feel better? I do, until the first moron responds back. And people say stuff on Facebook, if they stand in front of you, they wouldn't say, you'd pop them right in the nose. Give me an amen on that. I don't think you know what, I talk, what I'm talking I don't think you know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah? Well, here's a longer one. Well, I still think you're stupid. Well, here's what I think about you. <clears throat> Let my thing go. Amen. Yes or no? Oh. That action is meaningless. What action is meaningful? First, jot it down, or at least keep it in mind. Sowing the gospel seed. Amen. That's right. Yes. Sir. So, uh, preach. I knew you're going to go there yes, for Sunday sir. of the month. Yeah. Because how can you have a Christian nation? Watch it. This is very complicated now. How can you have a Christian nation without Christians? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. Do you know why our system works? Our system works because it was built upon a moral people. You know what Manatee County needs? She needs Christians. And we have to sow the gospel matters. The tracks going out tonight, and listen to me, whether you're a young person or whether you're a senior, it matters that we do it together. That's the Bible way. Yes, that's right. You don't find individual, oh, I'll do my own thing. The body, they gather together for prayer. Prayer. They went everywhere preaching the word. It was two by two. That implies the church was sending them out from them. Yes. Listen, it is important about sowing the gospel seed. And you say, well, I, I, we do it. It doesn't matter. Oh, it does. The results are the Lord's. But I want to be able to say, Lord, we did all that we could. Sowing the gospel seed matters. Secondly, sending out workers. Beloved, we need people that have surrendered. And I want to take just a moment. I want every young person in this room, I don't care how young you are, to listen to me. Especially those of you that are older. I was looking at the news the other day. I was watching the rioting and the stuff. You know, one of the thoughts that came across my mind is, I wonder where the Christian teens are. Where are the Christian teens? You know where they are? They're on silly little missions trips with matching t-shirts. They're on TikTok and Instagram. And they're making plans for their career and what they want to do. Yeah, those teens are misguided. Absolutely. But, but they've got more passion and more fire than many of our Christian teenagers. You let a young person say, I'm going to sell out and go do all and be a missionary for the Lord, and we almost talk them out of it. 
Now you know you're not going to have a lot of benefits and you know there's not... Listen to me. You need to do something great for God. Yes. And I'm not talking about in general. I'm talking about Anna and Samuel and Callie and Tucker and Anna, Kaylee, Brendan, Isaac, Seth, Luke, Yari, Kayla, Maddie, Ava, Mason, Grayson. I, I could go right down the line. Olivia, Titus, all, all of you. You, you. You've got to do something more than just what the other kids are doing. He said, well, what does it matter? I'm, I'm just a young person. It makes all the difference in the world. You got to give your heart to the Lord and give your life to the Lord. The richest and the deepest joy does not come from that dollar bill. Jacob, you have a talent that only God can use. Give it to Him. Naomi, you have a talent that only God can give you and use. Give it to Him. Don't settle. Don't be average. Don't be normal. He said, Preacher, what do you want for your children? I want them to be more than I ever could be. That's what we want. We need you. God wants you. Seth, you have abilities that only God can use. Surrender your heart and give it. And don't be a normal young person. Don't be that. You find you a corner if you're saved. And you say, dear Lord, I don't know what it means. If it means I go to the heart of Africa, fine. If it means I go into an inner city and start a church, fine. If it means I become a lawyer and get preachers out of jail, fine. If I become a doctor. But Lord, I want my life to be yours. Children and parents, you ought to be preaching that to your children and, and, and helping them with that. Inspire them. You need to be more than just a gamer. You need to be more than, I don't know, sandbag anything. Brother, when you go in, do it the best that you can. Give God your all. Give Him your life. And why aren't our churches doing that? We treat our, listen, when they go, when our young people in this world, everybody still with me, yes or no? When our young people in this world go to Islam or go to some military or go to something like that, they train them to be the best, to have a cause. We train our children, just don't do bad. If I can get them married without being pregnant and hooked on drugs, I've made it. Our children don't have the fire and the passion to do something great for God. And you know why? You know why? Because the only real fire and passion they see is most of the time when we bring a missionary in. They ought to see it at home. They ought to see you praying for them. They ought to know your heart for them. Do something great. Why? That's what mom and daddy want you to do. And if you're a, a, a truck driver, be it to the glory of God. Yes, right. If you're a fireman, be it to the glory of God. Not because it's just got good benefits. Yes. Do it to God's glory, young ladies. Yes. Young man, do something special for God. Listen to me, every young man in here, every young lady, listen to me. Listen to me. God has a unique calling just for you. That's right, Jesus. Something that no one else in this world can do, but only you can do, Luke. Only you. Olivia, there's a plan that God has just for you. Only you can do it. It's a beautiful, precious plan. But only you can do it, sweetie. Only you. And if you don't take that plan, Anna, and say, Lord, I'll follow that plan. Show me that plan. I'm yours. Is the ground going to open up and swallow you alive? Nope. Probably not. You'll probably get you a degree or get you a good paying job, get you a little house, get you a little family, live you a little average, casual life. And I'm going to tell you something. I've been around enough deathbeds. Yes. I've been around enough people that have died oh, that have yeah. said, I wish, yes. I wish yes. I had done something for God when I had the chance to do it. Yes. Are you going to do it? Will you do it? We need to act. And now what I'm saying for them, beloved, I say that for you and for me. Yes, we need to say, you know, I'm going to make my life count. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not 16. I don't get redos. Yeah, yeah. I'm not 16. Come I'm on. 60. Come on. What can I do? Forgetting those things which are behind and press right. toward the mark. That's right. Listen, every church in America ought to be filled up with senior citizens saying, what can I do? Yeah. I'm retired and I'm getting my communist paycheck. 
Amen? What can I do? Preachers ought to be having to deal with that. Why, why is that? Because they're no more surrendered now than they were when they... Yeah. It's, it's stunning to me. Listen, I'm not saying... Listen, I, I, Brother Richard and I, were, I, I told a plan and I wanted to try it really bad and I'm going to try it. And it's going to be a bear, I know, but I thought, you know what, wait a second. Wait a second now. If I can charge, you go to a church and you can charge $1,000 and say, listen, come with me to Haiti. Come with me to Honduras. Come with me for a mission trip. We're going to go do evangelism for a week. Why can't we do that here? Yes. Why can't you take a week off? You'll get to sleep in your own bed. Amen. But we'll have food. We'll have this. We'll go over and help Brother Sean with his church. We'll go up and help Brother Keith with his work that he's doing up in Dunella. We'll go do some adventure. Take a week off and serve God. Wait, we got to be entertained. Yeah. Got to feel romantic about it. Or is this? Does it matter? Does your life matter? Does it matter, beloved? It matters what we're doing. I know I sound like a nut. I know I sound redundant, but I'm trying to get you to rattle and understand every single one of you count because the time, listen, there's no more time. Don't you see? Don't you understand? They just shut our nation down for nothing. What do you think is going to happen the next time? We've got mayors all over this country that are telling police it's, it's a mess. It matters what we do. It matters what we do with our children. It matters what we do in our community. Listen, one of my favorite books of all time is the, is the book written by Joe Galloway and how more uh, called We Were Soldiers Once and Young. Yeah. Yeah. They made a movie with Mel Gibson. Now, there was a sergeant major, and I don't understand all the inner workings, but I believe that in the, the lieutenant is actually higher than the sergeant major, but the sergeant major answers to the big dog. There was a guy by the name, I want to say Plumley, I think yeah. was his name, Sergeant Major Plumley. He answered to Hal Moore. Well, Joe Galloway was there, and in the movie, I don't know if this happened in real life, but in the movie, there's a scene that's so amazing. They had called a broken arrow. That little group had landed and was overrun by the NVM, I and mean, just about overrun. And it was hand-to-hand, -hand, blood to blood. That Plumley was a, I mean, a rough man. <laughs> I mean, he was an ugly, rough, just one of those fellows that you just, I mean, he was a John Wayne's man, man. God give us some of those. Amen. He isn't perfect, but at least we got one of those in office for a change. Amen. Better to have that than a panty waist. Give me an amen right there. Amen. Boy, they're fighting back and forth and this and that. And Joe Galloway's trying to take some pictures. He was a cameraman. He was a reporter. And boy, he was shooting. He was flying around and all of a sudden a, a hand grenade went off and it threw him and he landed. When he landed, he looked down, he looked up, and that plumbly, that old, I mean, just cigar sticking out of his mouth, just the quintessential sergeant major standing there, said, Boy, what are you doing down there? You can't kill anybody down there. He threw him a rifle and said, Get up and come over here on the line. But Joe Galloway wasn't military, he was a civilian. And he looked up at him and said, No, 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 no. He said, I'm a non combatant. And that old grizzled sergeant major with bullets flying around and blood dripping off of him said, ain't no such a thing, ain't no such a thing as that today, boy. Ain't no such a thing as that today. You understand what he was saying? Hey, the perimeter was overrun. Ladies, let your man be a warrior. Let him be a warrior. Let him vent. Let him be angry. We need some good, godly, righteous anger. Yeah. Let your men serve. I love what the Spartan women used to say when their men would go off to war. Come home with your shield or come home on your shield, one or the other. God, give us some ladies to say, honey, go. Go with the men. I'll take care of the kids. Go do evangelism. Why? Hey, there's no such thing as a non-combatant today. There's no such thing as preachers and missionaries and evangelists and then the, the rest of the church people. Hey, brother, if you hadn't figured it out, the perimeter's been overrun. Yeah. It's time for God's people as a whole to pick up a weapon and fight for the cause of Christ. Yeah. No such a thing today. And certainly not here at Sun Coast Baptist. Amen. You matter. You say, I can't walk two steps. Then stand at the door and pray us out. Yeah. And smile as we come in. But you matter. What do you do? You have action that is meaningful. What do you do? You appeal to grace. What do you do? You attend to your own affairs. Don't you dare get mad at those people on TV and don't have the same amount of equal anger at your sin in your life. And then you accept the situation. What did you think it was going to be? What did you think it was going to look like? 
hey, we're here. Bad news, good news. Bad news, things aren't getting better horizontally. Good news, I'm heading up vertically. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, as we come to the close of the message, the real, real work begins. So where are we, Father? As a nation, we have detached ourselves, unanchored ourselves from God, and so the vehicle of invasion is irrelevant. This time it's Black Lives Matter. Last month it was the militarization of our police. Last month it was COVID-19. Last month it was Russian intrusion. The month before there it's this. It's just always something, but we need to understand the why. And it is because Marxism, communism, paganism is undermining the Christian element of this nation. Whatever last vestiges there are, and we need to see that. Spiritually, we need to see that we have been lulled to sleep. Okay, what do we do? Father, help us to accept it, to realize it. Okay, this, this is the end time. I mean, it might be another five or 10 years, but not to expect things to go back to normal, but things should be rough. Yeah, it's a fight. Why would we be surprised when we take rounds or mortar fire? This is where we are. We're in the enemy's territory to accept it. And then, Lord, to begin to follow some of those things we talked about, to attend to our own house. Maybe our marriage isn't right. Maybe our spirituality. Maybe there's some young people in here that are drifting away from the truth of their parents. And then, Lord, help us to appeal. More prayer. Could it be that we looked at Facebook more than we looked to the throne of grace? And then, Lord, to act, to matter. Now, we can get mad and fire off a Facebook message, and we can even get mad, and, and maybe we need to go protest, and we should. But, Lord, we must temper that with reaching our community with the gospel. The only hope for America is the gospel. Lord, help us. Lord, stir us. Lord, speak to our heart. I pray that you give us good rest and Father, keep the rain off and let us go out tonight sharing the gospel truth and doing what we can for our cause because our cause is Jesus. Bless us. Take us home safely. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Dismissed.